as we continue on in the book of Luke, or book of Mark, I'm sorry, um, we are introduced to this idea of leprosy, okay? Uh, just to be clear, this passage that we are studying today is not about how Jesus healed the leopard, okay? Sometimes, like, you ch- tell children, oh, Jesus healed the leopard. They think, leopard, that's all they know, right? So Jesus healed the leopard, and some of us might be thinking, wow, Jesus is awesome. He cares even for animals, you know, and like leopards. Well, I'm, sh- I'm sure Jesus does care for leopards, but today we're talking about this man who was healed of leprosy. He was a leper. Now, leprosy is a disease in the Bible that we read a lot about, but it's one thing that we don't know much about today in our, in our daily life. You know, for example, for all of us here, when you hear the word cancer, boom, things come to your mind, right? You think about people that you know who have had cancer. You think about characters in movies and TVs who have cancer. You think about different stages of cancer. Uh, you think about radiation treatment. You think about losing hair. You think about dying. There's all sorts of different kinds of cancer. So we quickly have all these images in our mind. But when you think about leprosy, we don't have that kind of context. But the people who were originally reading Mark's letter, they did. And so when they hear leper, boom, they have all these thoughts, all these images and understandings that we don't necessarily have. We'll explain it further, but for now, just keep in mind that leprosy was very prevalent during the time of Jesus. And they say that even in some places in the world today, there are places where this still exists, and it's more known as what's called Hansen's disease, but it still does exist in some places in the world today. But leprosy was a devastating disease that would slowly destroy a person physically. Now, When you look at the Bible, the writers of the Bible would often use leprosy, this physical disease, as a picture or as an illustration of our spiritual condition because of a disease we have called sin. So sometimes we would say we have a spiritual leprosy, basically saying that we have a sin disease, sin problem, and sometimes we picture that through physical leprosy in the scriptures. So when we think about our own life, From the moment we're born, we are born with spiritual leprosy. We're born with this disease called sin. Uh, Our parents, Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the garden, what happened? Humanity became sick with sin. And so now every person that's born, every person in humanity is born with this disease called sin. Sin is an epidemic that is not just contagious. It's not contagious. We are born with it. We didn't catch it. We're born with it. And this disease of sin cripples and destroys our lives, our families, our communities, and our nations. There is no realm of our life that is not destroyed and ravaged by the disease of sin or spiritual leprosy. So that's what we're talking about today, spiritual leprosy, sin. So if you've been here, we've been going through the Gospel of Mark. We started at the very beginning. We talked about the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, how this is Gospel being written for the persecuted Christians in Rome at the time. We talked about how when Jesus enters the scene, there's baptism, his initiation, his ministry of representation. We talked about his temptation that comes. We talked about being fishers of men. Jesus goes and calls fishermen to become fishers of men. We talked about how Jesus casts out evil spirits, unclean spirits. He's the final authority. And then we talked about how Jesus is our healer. He's the healer that has come. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about not three, just two. Just two two points today. Um, The leper, and we'll talk about Jesus. Two, Two points, a few Sub points under each one, but just two points, okay? So first of all, we're going to talk about problem of being unclean, the leper, and then we'll talk about Jesus and his mission to declare, to declare clean. We'll see what, we'll see what we mean. So first of all, let's talk about the leper, a problem of being unclean. Look at verse 40. And a leper came to him, imploring him, Okay, that is a strong word, imploring him 
and kneeling and said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. This is utter desperation. So when we look at this leper, we're saying that there's a problem of being unclean. Now, I think we can think about it in a few ways to help us better understand that problem of being unclean. So a few ways we want to think about that. Problem number one, okay. for this leper, part of his problem is that he has no pain. A doctor named Paul Brand discovered that the cause of disfigurement associated with leprosy, known as Hansen's disease, is that the body's warning system of pain is destroyed. That's why a lot of lepers have missing fingers or missing extremities. The problem for lepers is that they cannot feel pain. Now, we might think, man, that would be incredible. You know, like I could play sports. I could like run into somebody. I don't feel pain. I'll be fine. I can keep playing. But if you think about that a little bit, we think it would be great not to feel pain. But a few days ago, Sojin was heating up some bread in our little toaster oven. You know, those toaster ovens. And so she's heating up this bread. And then she reaches in and she's taking out the bread after it's finished baking. And so while she reaches in, it's a very narrow opening, if you know a toaster oven, she reaches in and then the top of her hand touches the top of the toaster oven that's really hot. And so what happens is immediately she feels that heat and then pulls her hand back because of the pain. Now, we kind of joked about it because she had a burn mark, and that burn mark, it looks just like the Under Armour symbol. It's like really cool. It's like she's like wearing Under Armour skin, you know? <laughs> but she pulled her hand back because of the pain. Now, imagine if she doesn't feel pain. She's going to leave her hand there. Not only is the bread toasting, but her hand's going to be toasting as well. Right? Pain saved her. Pain was a blessing because it kept her from leaving her hand there and getting burned further. Now imagine in some less developed places where in the world people sleep on the dirt. You're sleeping on the dirt and let's say you have open cuts or wounds in your skin. Insects, mice, other parasites are coming and they're eating away at your skin, at the open flesh of a leper while you sleep and you don't wake up because you don't, like, you don't feel pain. You don't feel anything on you. So imagine touching your stove, getting cut by a knife, your finger is cut off, and you don't feel it. Something falling on your toe. No pain would mean that you never have a warning to get away from that danger. Pain is a blessing because it protects us. Pain helps us to avoid what is dangerous. Pain is a wonderful thing, even though we don't like it. And so remember, physical picture of leprosy pictures a spiritual reality of being spiritual lepers, sinners in our life. So it's similar spiritually. One of the worst things that can happen is when you become numb to the pain of sin in your life. You could be living in sin, hurting yourself through sin, but what does sin want you to do? It causes your heart to slowly become callous, to the pain of sin. It's like you go this far, at first you felt guilt and shame, but then you get used to it. And so then you can go a little further and you get used to this. And so going here is like no big deal anymore. You got used to it, so you can take a step further now. What happens? That keeps going down. So slowly, instead of feeling guilt when we sin, we become so used to it. But that guilt, that pain, is actually a blessing. God doesn't want you to live in that guilt and stay there. But sometimes guilt can be a blessing if it makes you run to the grace of God that's available. And so sometimes when we're living in our life and we feel pain or guilt, we should be so thankful because that guilt reminds us that this is not where we should be and we can turn and we can run to the grace of God. And that's what God wants us to experience. So the problem for this leper and the problem that sometimes we can fall into is not having that pain and not allowing ourselves to experience that guilt that turns us to grace. Then there's a second problem. 
for this leper. Not only the problem of no pain, but the problem of no fellowship. So the severity of leprosy meant that it was a disease that was greatly feared. I mean, so feared that there were strict rules, laws in place, so that that disease could be isolated from other people. So lepers were not even allowed, they say, to stand under a tree. They, they believe that if you stand under a tree, if you're a leper, and then something, your leprosy would somehow rub off onto that tree, maybe you touch a leaf, and they believe you walk away, and then someone else comes, and somehow they touch that leaf, they believe that you could get leprosy. It was that feared. So for this reason, once you got leprosy, you were forced to move out. You were forced to be away from your family and friends. So lepers, what happened is they were banished to colonies outside the city, outside the camp. They were banished to these places, and they could not be existing in normal places anymore. It said that if by any chance they're in the leper colony, if any chance they have to go to the town or to the city, what they would have to do is they would have to walk in a way and yell, unclean, unclean, so that everyone would hear them coming and everyone would get out of the way knowing that I can't get close to that person because I could get leprosy from them. They had to warn people that they were coming. Can you imagine that? They would have to intentionally make their hair as messy as possible, wear ragged clothes, and walk around with their hands up, yelling, unclean, unclean. This commentator, Mark Strauss, he writes, to ensure against contact with society, lepers were required to make their appearance as repugnant as possible. Do you ever wake up in the morning and think, how can I look, make myself look repugnant, right? As repugnant as possible. Josephus, who's a famous historian, he speaks of the banishment of lepers as though as those, look at this, in no way differing from a corpse. A corpse. So lepers were basically dead people walking alive. They were the walking dead, they say. So lepers in those times were so despised that it was not uncommon for people walking as lepers they would have rocks being thrown at them. Get out of here. Get out of our town. Get out of our city. You're going to contaminate us. And so people would still throw stones at them when they're passing by. So think about this leper. Can you imagine the incredible social difficulty when everyone is avoiding you like the plague, throwing stones at you in hatred, you're walking around yelling unclean, unclean, you're looking as repugnant as possible so that everyone will get away, you are isolated socially. Now, in the same way spiritually, when we think about sin in our life, it does the same thing. It can strain and, and sever our relationships with other people. When we are in sin, we, we isolate ourselves sometimes so that we don't get caught. Also, sometimes when we are being sinfully selfish, we become people that others don't want to be around because of our sin and our selfishness. A good example is, of course, Adam and Eve. What happened? Once they sinned in the garden, they started to fight. They started to blame each other. Violence entered their family. It's just like that for us. When we are not doing well spiritually, we distance ourselves from fellowship. We might run to relationships that are based on ungodliness. You know, usually when we're in a state of sin, what happens? We look for people. We look for people that will affirm our sin. And we get away from those people that will challenge us in that way, in a loving way. So we see this second problem. So then one more problem that we see with this leper is that the third problem here is that there is no worship. No worse. This is very important. So lepers, because of their status as social outcasts, now remember, they're contagious. They cannot enter into public places of worship. Okay? I'm going to read, continue on with what Mark Strauss writes. He says this. The Old Testament set out detailed steps for the diagnosis of the disease. In Levit Leviticus 13, 
which rendered the victim ceremonially unclean and required separation from family, friends, and religious life of the community. Touching a leper, okay? Touching a leper, like touching a corpse, resulted in temporary ceremonial uncleanness. Only a priest could declare a person clean or unclean of the disease. Those judged unclean were required to live outside the community. Now, I want you to remember that. Outside the community, outside the town, outside the camp, they were required to be. So note this idea of being ceremonially unclean. It has to do with worship. So can you imagine the strain on this person who is a leper? You're never able to enter into the town, never able to enter into a place of worship where others are gathered. So for their entire life after become a leper, they would be unable to sing with other people. They would be unable to worship in a place. They'd be unable to hear God's word being preached to them. They'd be unable to gather in fellowship with others. So especially in these biblical times, it was huge to gather together, to gather in the temple even more than it is now. There's something about worshiping together where we experience that it's just like heaven, you know. In heaven, no one's going to do their quiet time by themselves. In heaven, we're going to be gathered with a multitude, an assembly of people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. We're going to be worshiping, confessing that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. We're going to be doing that together. And so when we gather together in church or in the worship places in this passage, that's what we're doing. We're picturing that. We were meant for that. We are created to be worshipers together. And so this leper, he's missing out. He's not experiencing what he was meant for. So the inability of lepers to worship really pictures the way sin hinders our ability to worship. Sin hinders us because God in his holiness can have nothing to do with the filth of our sin. In fact, God hates sin He may love us as a sinner, he does, but he hates the sin that we have in our lives. That's why Jesus needs to be the mediator between us and God. Our sins deserve death, but Jesus comes to die on our behalf so that we can live, so that we can approach the throne as worshipers. So let's think about now these three problems to summarize a little bit. This passage here is picturing the life that we live as spiritual lepers. Leprosy makes a person unclean. Unclean ceremonially according to Jewish ceremonial laws. So for us, we are unclean spiritually because of sin. It's not a physical disease for us like leprosy, but it's a spiritual disease that we're born with. This leper desperately needed Jesus because he was unclean in the same way we too need Jesus because we are spiritually unclean. So now if you think about this problem, layers of problem, what's going on here in verse 40 is amazing. This leper has somehow made his way to Jesus and is asking for cleansing. Can you imagine? He's come into the town where he's not welcome from outside the town. He's probably had stones being thrown at him as he walked towards Jesus down the road. But somehow in his mind, he knew and he believed in his heart that Jesus, the great healer who he had been hearing about, had come to this town and he believed that Jesus could make him clean. And so that's why he approaches in boldness and courageousness and says, Jesus, if you're willing, he implores him, He says, if you're willing, you can make me clean. In the same way spiritually, when we see the disease of our own sin, we ought to have the same reaction. We ought to run to the great healer who can make us clean. Do we run to him? Do we have that understanding, that desire? I think what we have to ask ourselves is, what is it that keeps us from running to Jesus like this for cleansing. I think think there's two categories of people, two ways in which we don't let ourselves run to Jesus. Let me just dwell on this. 
first type of problem is when we think to ourselves, I can't see my sin. It's an attitude. It's an attitude where we're blind to the reality of our own sin and our selfishness. Sadly, there's many of us, myself included, that are blind like this at times. When we're proud, when there's hubris, when there's arrogance, all we see is ourself. Everyone else is the problem except us. And we cannot see our sin and we're blind. And so we blame everything else, everyone else but us, and we're blind and unable to see our sin. If you can't see your sin, you can't repent. And the more you grow spiritually, what happens is the more you'll see your sin. That's what growing is. Apostle Paul, at the end of his life, what does he say? He says, I am the worst of sinners. It's not that he was actually sinning more. What he saw is that he sins so much, he saw that more and more in his life. It became more reality, and that's why he treasured the grace of God so much. So I can't see my sin as a dangerous place to be. But the other side of that is also a dangerous place. Sometimes we say, I can only see my sin. It's a problem when you see your sin, but you're blind to his love, his grace. You're blind to your Savior. When we're this kind of person, what we feel like is, Jesus, I don't think he can love me. I don't think he can forgive me. I don't think I'm worthy of his love. This kind of person sometimes might believe, yes, God's love is unconditional. God's grace is for everyone. God loves every single person. God can forgive anyone of anything except me. Some of us sometimes might feel like that. The Savior, Jesus, might be waiting in front of their arms, in front of their face, but they cannot see because all they can see is their own sin. So we have to have this balance, as I say many times. We have to vividly see our sin because it keeps you humble and broken. It makes you realize your need. But while seeing your sin, you have to vividly see your Savior the Savior that loves you, the Savior that forgives you, the Savior that restores you. And that's what this leper is doing. He sees his illness, but he sees the healer. He comes to Jesus, implores him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. He saw his need, but he saw Jesus. So as we think about this leper, this problem of being unclean, we have to realize that we too share in this problem of being unclean as spiritual lepers. We need to run to Jesus for cleansing like this leper does. But let me tell you, what is amazing here is that while we need to run to Jesus for this cleansing, while we're still sinners, what happens is God, we find out, was first running to us. We need to run to him, but we realize Jesus is already on a mission running to us to declare us clean. That's what we're going to talk about. His mission to declare clean. Look at verse 42. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. So when we think about Jesus, he's on, first of all, a physical mission. Jesus, picture this, who is God himself, reaches out his hand physically to this leper, touches him, and heals him. Jesus, he touches what everyone else there would see as grotesque. The man that they threw stones at. The man they wanted out of their town. The man that would contaminate them. The man Jesus saw, he touched. When Jesus sees the physical suffering of people like this leper, as we've been learning about Jesus, he overflows with compassion. Jesus is not someone that like, you know, we're like, for us, it's like, oh gosh, help me to love him or help me to love her tomorrow. She just, this person annoys me. It's like, help me to love them. And we go and then we give it, we give it, we run out and then we have to go back again, right? For Jesus, it's not like that. He sees this person. He 
embodies compassion. He doesn't have to generate it. It's just who he is. So Jesus cannot help but to compassionately love whoever is close before him. And it says here that Jesus touched him. What happens? The leprosy left him. What? Not an hour later, not one week later, the leprosy left him immediately. Now remember, this is Mark's favorite word. Every passage, I think, so far has had this word immediately in it. So this leprosy, he touches, immediately the leprosy is gone. Going to go to the commentator Mark Strauss one more time. It says, rather than turning from the leper, Jesus turns to him. Indeed, he touches him, bringing himself into full contact with physical and ritual untouchability. The outstretched arm of Jesus is a long reach for his day for any day. It removes the social, physical, and spiritual separations prescribed by the Torah and customs alike. The touch of Jesus speaks more loudly than his words, and the words of Jesus touch the leper more deeply than any act of human love. So we need to remember this. Can you remember this? Whatever you and I, whatever we're going through, wherever we have been, however filthy we might feel, However guilty we might be, however much we've sinned, even if you just came from it, no matter where you are spiritually and how far you feel from God, Jesus always wants to touch us. No matter what, he always wants to touch us. He's on a mission to reach out to you and I. Not only is on a physical mission, he's on a social mission. So Jesus reaches out to this leper who is cut off from all social networks. I mean, literally, everyone has unfriended him. Remember, Jesus is the one who sought out the rejected ones of society. Jesus would often sit with tax collectors and prostitutes. Jesus would pursue the ones who were oppressed and cast aside. So the mission of Jesus is not necessarily just to reach the lovable ones in our lives. We're very good at reaching the lovable ones in our lives. But the mission of Jesus is to reach the ones who are unlovable according to society. Look at what Jesus does. He pursues this man that no one else would dare to pursue. He pursues the lonely outcast. He pursues the rejected one. He pursues this untouchable and unlovable one. And that's what Jesus does to us. We are the outcast. We are the rejected. We are the unlovable. We are the untouchable from a holy God. But that's what Jesus does to us as spiritually le- as spiritual lepers. You know, we may be broken, unlovable, Damaged, lonely, discouraged, filthy, unworthy. But Jesus breaks through all barriers to love us. Isn't that amazing? He breaks through all barriers to love us. He's on mission. So as Christians, if we are in Christ, we need to picture this Jesus who has broken through all barriers to love us proof that you really have experienced that is when we turn outwards to the world and we break through all barriers to love the unlovable and the untouchable. There may be people around us who are outcasts, unpopular, unwanted, uncared for. Shouldn't it be ones who are touched, who go and touch them with Christ's love, as Christ's representatives? Can I ask you this? When you think about the person who is unlovable, when you think about the person who is alone or outcast or unpopular, uncared for, unwanted, is there someone that comes to your mind right now? Is there someone at your work, someone that you see sitting across the cafeteria, someone you see in one of your classes, someone who lives nearby you, 
Someone that you see at a store? Is there someone in your life that you see that comes to mind? And can I challenge us? Maybe if there's someone that pops into your mind right now, perhaps Jesus is calling you to be his hands and feet and to go and touch them this week. Hope that you would do that if God is leading you. So then finally, we see there is a physical mission, a social mission, but most importantly, there's a spiritual mission here. Look at verse 44. And said to him, so now the leper is cleansed. He's clean. Immediately it went away. And he said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. Jesus doesn't want commotion to start. He can't go to other places to minister. But go show yourself to the priest and offer your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. Now, what, what is going on here? If you think about it, Jesus cleanses this guy. Shouldn't there be a celebration and party for this man who's a leper has suddenly been cleansed and he's been set free from the captivity of this disease? Shouldn't there be a party? But Jesus wants to keep it quiet so he can go to other places and minister. This leper is told, instead, what he should do is he should follow what's prescribed in the law according to Moses. And what we see is the Old Testament has value to Jesus, so he's to do what Moses commanded. And where do we find that? We have to go to that to understand what's going on, what Jesus wants him to do. That comes from Leviticus chapter 14. Right? Uh, I know m- most of us, we don't read Leviticus too regularly. But we're going to read it right now. Okay? I tried to squeeze all of this in one screen. Okay, So... Don't be intimidated here. Okay. It's not that bad. Okay. Leviticus 14, 1 to 7 describes what happens when a leper, this guy, is cleansed according to the Old Testament. You're to go to a priest who would then be able to declare you as ceremonially unclean. Now, read these seven verses with me. The Lord said to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. So here's this guy. He's cleansed today. This is that day. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp. Remember we talked about out of the city, out of the town, out of the camp? And the priest shall look, check him out, examination. Then if the case of leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command them, his helpers, to take for him who is to be cleansed two live clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel over fresh water. He shall take the live bird with the cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over fresh water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. Then he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird go, go into the open field flying away. Now what is going on here? Let me quickly explain because this is amazing. This is, once I explain, you'll see this is pretty simple but profound and blessing. So this ceremony seems very strange to us, but it is a powerful picture. So here's two birds that the priest has to get when this leper is healed. So you get two birds. One of the birds is killed. What does this dead bird represent? This dead bird points forward to and represents Christ who will be killed on the cross in our place. Blood dripping, blood of this bird dripping. So the other live bird, then what happens is taken, and the live bird is dipped into the blood of this dead bird. When the live bird is dipped into that dead bird's blood, it represents the cleansed leper. Those items like cedar wood, scarlet yarn, hyssop were items that had to do with cleansing. They had cleansing properties to them. So then what happens is after the live bird is dipped into the dead bird's blood, the live bird then is set free to fly, to fly away, to fly free and to go. And so freedom to fly is given by the death 
of this other bird. It was a picture of cross-like sacrifice and atonement. It's a picture of our spiritual lives. We are dead in sin because of our spiritual leprosy, but Christ dies on the cross on our behalf. His blood is sprinkled upon us. It cleanses us, and we are declared, we are declared clean. Because we are declared clean, the bird didn't do anything, but because we are declared clean, we are set free, free to fly. We now live in spiritual freedom, set free from the shackles of sin. It is for freedom that we have been set free and Christ's blood was shed. How does this cleansing take place? Through the healing touch of Jesus who died on our behalf as pictured by this dead bird. When he touches us, he takes our sin immediately and we are cleansed. We are declared cleansed by his blood. When he touches us, immediately we receive his righteousness. He's the high priest who went out to bring us into the camp, into the family of God. He went out to bring us in. We are no longer seen and judged by God for the life that we lived but now we are seen and judged by God for the life that Christ lived. We get credited with his righteousness, even though we didn't earn or deserve it. He went outside of the camp. We were banished outside of the camp because of our sin, our spiritual leprosy, but he went outside of the camp to bring us back into the camp, into the family. And he is banished to the cross so that we can be brought into the family of God. Isn't that amazing? We didn't do anything. We didn't deserve it. But we are set free because of his blood. When we think about this passage, we see the leper's problem of sin. We all have that same problem. Spiritual leprosy. But what we see is Jesus' mission to declare. That word declare is very important. To declare clean. I'm going to close with an illustration to just illustrate the importance of declare. Okay? Very ordinary illustration, but I think it's very helpful and maybe a little profound, but it's very ordinary. Okay? Um, in our house, we've been struggling with bathroom faucets. Okay? We've been struggling because of what's called water stains on all of our bathroom faucets. I don't know if it's the water we have or something, but you know, can, can I advise you when you buy a house someday and you buy stuff like this, buy like brushed nickel because it stays cleaner. If you buy chrome, it looks good when you buy it, but it gets so dirty, right? So chrome looks good, shiny, but it gets so dirty. So anyways, no matter how much I tried, I could not remove the stains of this water stains. I tried different brushes, sponges, toothbrushes, someone else's toothbrush. I tried everything, right? But I could not get the stains off. You know, I even, we, in our Korean culture, we even have like this kind of body scrubbing thing, and we even use that. I could not get it off. Nothing works. I bought every kind of bathroom cleaner that's available in the store. I even tried Windex, which is for glass, but nothing would get it off. So this past week, as I did some research on YouTube, I had an incredible breakthrough. I found out that you don't even need any of this stuff. There's only one thing that works. And so I found out through my research that if you let it soak in just ordinary vinegar, what happens is it breaks down the stains. And so I tried it. So I, you soak a rag or a cloth, and then you just cover it, right? You cover it, and they say, for 30 minutes. Right? And then what happens is you cover it, and then there's something going on chemically in there, and then I take off the rag. My goodness, with my finger, I just wipe it off, and it becomes completely clean, like brand new from the store kind of clean. And I saw this, and I thought, hallelujah, that is the gospel. <laughs> right? Clean. And clear of stains through the vinegar poured out for this faucet. <laughs> now, the problem is, this illustration quickly breaks down. 
because I realized got it clean like that, but after a few days usage, it gets dirty again, and it looks like the left side again, stains. And so I realized that's not the gospel. The gospel is when Christ declares us clean, declares us clean, it is not he makes us clean for a while. It is not temporary you're clean for that day. When Christ declares us clean because of our faith in him and we become a follower of Christ, when Christ declares us clean, it is a once and for all thing. Past, present, future sins. You are clean, period, is what the gospel says. Once you are declared clean, declared righteous, God always sees you that way. You know, the reality is that we look like the faucet on the left. Maybe there's stuff going on in your secret sins and stuff going on in your struggles and your anger and frustrations and different things. We all have that. And reality is that we look a lot more like the faucet on the left. And you know what we do? We try to scrub it. We try to clean it. We try to get it off doing all these different things. But if we're in Christ, even though the reality is we're on the left, in Christ, Christ declares us clean. And so when he sees us, when God sees us with his eyes, he doesn't see the left, but he sees the right. He sees us as clean. So then what is the motivation? Many of us, we think, I want to clean, I want to clean myself, get it right, use all these cleansing agents around me so that I can be right and I can gain approval from God and be righteous. No, no, no. The gospel is simply because of our faith in Christ who loved us and died for us while we were still sinners. He declares us clean even though we're filthy like on the left. He declares us clean and now our response is, now that I'm a child of God, I want to love my father. Now that I'm saved, I want to follow him more and love him more. Because he has loved me with all of his heart, I want to love him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And our following, our serving, our doing things is out of gratitude and response, not to earn or to get his approval. I pray that we would always remember that if you're in Christ, if you're in Christ, he has declared you clean. We don't need to try to earn it. We don't need to fight to get to that approval state. But he looks at you and you're declared clean. You got to believe it. You got to know it in your heart that you are cleansed. Pray that every single one of us would leave this place like that bird that is set free to fly. Let's pray together.